So it's my great, great privilege to welcome Hannah Beach to Berkeley and to be the keynote speaker for today's conference. Hannah can tell you in detail, but as far as I know, she's come from at least four different countries in Southeast Asia. She's in Berkeley for a couple days and she's going to several more. So we're really, really lucky that she had the time and was able to make it. Um, she, uh, Hannah, is uh, she's an American journalist. Since 2017, she's been the Southeast Asia Bureau Chief for the New York Times, based in Bangkok, and she has formerly worked for Time Magazine. And she's going to really give us a perspective, uh, from a journalistic perspective, of reporting on this desperate situation of the Rohingya refugees. Um, and she's reported on this since uh, 2017. In 2009, Hannah, Hannah was awarded um, for the Excellence in Reporting Breaking News. She received honorable mention in the Society of Publishers and Asia, Award, Asia Awards for Editorial Excellence for her reporting on Cyclone Nargis in Burma. She also received a 2007 honorable mention for Best Opinion Writing. Hannah graduated in 1995 from Colby College, and she did undergraduate internships at US News and World Report and at many Asian <laughs> media outlets. <laughs> we, are, we are honored to have Hannah today, and um, so we look forward to her talk. So she will speak for about half an hour, 35 minutes, and then we will open it up to Q&A. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to preface this by saying that I am not uh, an academic. I'm not a policymaker. Uh, I'm not an activist. I'm basically a glorified note taker. Uh, so with that caveat in mind, um, and I'm also, as you can tell, this is supposed to be sort of an atmospheric picture, but I'm not a great photographer either. <laughs> <laughs> um, in 2009, I found myself in Zitwe, the capital of Rakhine State. And it's important to remember that it was a mixed city back then. Mm -hmm. At the market, there were ethnic Rakhine women buying fish and vegetables from, from Rohingya fishermen and farmers. There were Buddhist monks who were collecting alms actually from Rohingya. There was a photocopy shop run by a Rohingya man who was so excited to see a foreigner that he rushed out of his shop and asked me in English, is there anything you want to photocopy? <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't really have anything, but we stopped and talked for hours. There were law offices with Muslim names hand-painted on signs, and doctors, too. Uh, this is, the, you can see sort of in the back of the building, which I will explain. Uh, this is the Jama Mosque uh, on the main street in Sitwe, and it was built in 1859. Uh, and I met the Imam, and again, we talked and talked. Three years later, in April 2012, I was in Sitwe again with my family. And we were actually on holiday, heading up to Mrotwu, to the Buddhist temple ruins. Mm -hmm. It was right after the by-elections in Myanmar, the ones in which Dong San Suu Kyi's party won a resounding victory. And it was that first kind of hopeful <coughs> moment, um, not just within the journalistic community, but within the domestic community, that maybe things might be changing. I had spent years sneaking into the MLD office in Yangon. I pretended to be an antique dealer because it was impossible to get journalist visas at the time. And the night of the by-elections, the street in front of the MLD headquarters was jammed with people. Um, it was late, uh, but my husband, who was living in China at the time with my kids, thought it was a historic moment. It was kind of like the Berlin coming wall mm -hmm. that down. And so we took our baby boys <coughs> just to see democracy alive. This is actually in the NLD headquarters. Um, but when we went to Sitwe, just days after the by-election, something felt not quite right. We met a Buddhist abbot whom I had known because he had helped stand up to the junta in some of the first monk-led protests in 2007. He actually gave my boys a little bead that he had said had been made from the, the bones of the Buddha to keep them safe. But he also talked about how Sitwe was changing, how it was being flooded by Kalar, which is that awful pejorative used for Muslim Burmese. I wanted to go see that imam at the Jamma Mosque too, but my Rakhine friend said it wasn't really safe for my boys. Still, when we went up to Moku, we wandered through a village with Rohingya inhabitants who were mixed in with Rakhine. My boys played with their boys, a beaten up ball, a goat to pet. That's my kid with a goat. 
Um, a few months later, Sitwe exploded. When I went back in November 2012, parts of the city looked like the aftermath of a cyclone or an earthquake. Entire neighborhoods raised to the ground. There were pages in Arabic scattered among the wreckage. Many mosques with missing windows or doors, or walls even. The Jamma Mosque was still there, but it was behind razor wire. The soldiers wouldn't let me in. I went to see the Buddhist abbot again, and he was full of more hatred about how the Kalar were raging some kind of population jihad. They have so many children, he said, seven or eight children per family. I asked about the ethnic Rakhine, how many kids did they have? And he said, oh, six or seven. It didn't seem like a big difference. <laughs> the Rohingya who had been at market, the doctors, the teachers, the lawyers, they were all in camps or ghettos. Again, it felt like the result of a natural disaster, where people were piled in emergency housing before they could rebuild their lives. It didn't occur to me then that they wouldn't be doing so that eight years later, the camps had taken on a permanence, that northern Rakhine was also going to be erased of the Rohingya, that most of all, the people have been erased. In Sitwe today, there's a collective amnesia, and maybe if I hadn't seen the place with my own eyes, it wouldn't be so shocking. Talk to many Rakhine, and they won't admit that just a few years ago, there were Muslim shops, and there were Muslim neighborhoods, that it was a diverse city, that they had Rohingya classmates and teachers. Jamma Mosque is still behind razor wire. It's disused and it's decaying. The trap is degrading its beauty. Almost all of the other mosques are gone. Bulldozers have done their work. I bring up Sitwe how identity can be obliterated because it's important to remember what was there. Too often when we talk about refugees, these masses of stateless people, three quarters of a million Rohingya who fled northern Rakhine since August 2017, it's kind of hard to cherish the individual, the zoologist who studied at Rangoon University, the fisherman who caught the fattest fish, the homemaker who made the tastiest fish curry, and I can tell you it was very tasty. To be a refugee is to be dehumanized, as we've heard throughout the day today. Bangladesh has accorded incredible generosity to the Rohingya. In late August and September 2017, I watched this endless stream, which so many of you have talked about already, come over the hills into Bangladesh. There were so many of them, and it was the height of the monsoons. It was trauma and mud and exhaustion and more mud. These are from the first days. This is about August 28th, um, just as people were, were coming over the border. The countryside south of Fox's Bazaar is beautiful. It's emerald rice paddies and lush jungle, but the hills were soon denuded for the Rohingya camps. <coughs> Orchards were cleared, forests gutted, bamboo groves converted into more and more shacks for more and more people. Within a couple months, this lovely countryside was a settlement of shacks to the horizon and beyond. The elephants were confused, and they rampaged occasionally, killing Rohingya children as they tried to find their old watering paths. In the beginning, these new camps had sort of a temporary feel. Everyone was just struggling to find their little patch of earth. Then shacks were built, and food stalls and mosques. It ri reminded me of Sitwe, where people regarded the IDP camps as a provisional place before going home. <coughs> I don't think we can pretend, as both the Myanmar and the Bangladeshi governments do, that there is a going home anytime soon. Mm -hmm. It's politically expedient to say, oh, re repatriation is going to happen. I've written so many stories about deadlines and plans and missed deadlines and missed plans. The truth, if you go to Myanmar, is that the Rohingya have been re expunged from the historical record. Burmese officials will look you in the eye and say, no, there are no Rohingya here, none at all. And what is there to say except wonder if they believe it, or are they just saying it because they have to? I suspect if they repeat it enough, it becomes their truth, 
just like the notion that the Rohingya are really illegal immigrants from Bangladesh. That idea has taken a hold across the country. The Rohingya villages in northern Rakhine, with the exception of a few thousand, a few hundred thousand people, whether it's three, four, five, six, we don't quite know, but they are gone. Army or border guard force bases have been built on some of them. There is a vast, empty, burned space that is gradually being filled by the Mara Rakhine migrants. Last year I was in the Czech Republic and I read a plaque in an old Jewish synagogue in a town called Mikolov. It was a center of Jewish learning in Europe in the 16th century. Now there's a plaque about the repression and the Holocaust. The synagogue is used for cultural purposes, not worship. Mm -hmm. I've been on several government tours in northern Rakhine, and as a journalist, you kind of chafe at the idea of going on a government tour. But it's useful to see what they <coughs> want you to see, and nothing ever goes quite according to script. Even with government minders, it's impossible to miss what's not there. Mongdal, for instance, which is one of the, the two, two and a half districts that was most disproportionately affected by the, um, by the exodus in 2017, was around 90% Muslim before. Now it's a fraction of that. We went to empty repatriation centers. I was presented with Rohingya, whom I was, whom I was told had recently returned from Bangladesh, successful <coughs> cases of repatriation. But when we used the Rohingya language to communicate with them, which the Burmese didn't understand, it turned out that they had never left at all. They had been in jail, and when they were released, they were handed over to foreigners to give us a charade. It was all a lie. I kept on taking geotagged pictures of places and sending them to people I knew in the camps in Bangladesh. They couldn't place anything. Where homes once were, there was nothing. The only thing often that marks a Rohingya village are these kind of few burnt palm trees rising out of the brush. The tropics work quickly to wipe away traces of human existence. Yet even if their homes are gone and were kind, how can people put down roots in Bangladesh if there's still this fiction that any day now there's going to be some massive uh, repatriation to, to Myanmar? Besides, as, as many of you have noted, there's always a threat of relocation for some of them to an island in the Bay of Bengal, another place designed with impermanence. There was good news last month when the Bangladeshi government allowed for limited schooling of the camps, but it was in Burmese for a certain age group, 11 to 13, I think. And talking to people on the ground, it's not clear what will actually happen and whether it will translate to actual learning. Since an internet blackout was imposed a few months ago, it's been much harder to communicate with people in the camps unless you're there. <coughs> and getting a journalist visa to Bangladesh has become more complicated than it used to be. Mm -hmm. WhatsApp messages are sporadic and increasingly desperate. It's in these shadowy spaces that rumors thrive. And it's also in these dark places where human traffickers and religious extremists flourish. A couple weeks into the exodus of 2017, as people were still struggling for food and shelter and clothing, for sustenance, both material and spiritual, there were charity groups from Saudi handing out the niqab. In Rakhine, I rarely saw them. The preference was for loose, more colorful veils. In the camps now, the niqab is common. Mm -hmm. Within days of the Rohingya fleeing northern Rakhine in 2017, there were men in spotless white clothes from Hifazat, the strict Bangladeshi Islamic group. They spoke Chittagonian Bangla, close to Rohingya. Mm -hmm. And they funded some of the first mosques in Kutupalong extension <coughs> camp. There was a need, and they met it. Before it became too politically sensitive, I could go to some of these Hifazat mosques and sometimes meet kids, and they were little more than kids, who had joined Arsa in the camps, or who had joined the group back home. Desperation breeds groups like Arsa. It breeds intifadas. With no end in sight, this could become another Palestine. It's at our peril to ignore the danger signals 
such as when the Bangladeshi government sometimes says ARSA isn't operating the camps, or ARSA is going to take over everything, or when Rohingya leaders say that ARSA is a figment of crazy Burmese nationalists. ARSA exists. It certainly has nowhere the, the same power that other ethnic armed groups in Myanmar have, but it has killed people in Myanmar, and it has killed people in the camps of Bangladesh. In 2015, I was in Indonesia and Malaysia reporting on the Rohingya boat people who took the perilous passage to Southeast Asia. Boats were turning up with half-dead Rohingya in tales of harrowing months at sea. It was when the Thais and Malaysians in particular, after years of kind of ignoring or even profiting from the trade, began to dig up mass graves of Rohingya in the border between the two countries. I was in the city of Penang in Malaysia and went to meet members of the Rohingya community there. The men were mostly construction workers, and some had recently welcomed their new wives who had arrived by boat from the IDB camps in Sitra and from the older refugee settlements in Bangladesh. It became clear that the women, girls really, were trafficked, that they had been sold to their husbands that they never met before. One teenaged girl had bruises on her cheek and her neck, like this sort of delicate pattern of flowers. Her one human connection was with her husband, whom she'd only met a couple of months before. He was much older in his 40s. I don't know exactly how old she was, but I would say 16, 17. His life was spent as an undocumented worker in a foreign country. Sometimes he said he didn't get paid and he had no recourse. At night, he brought his wife onions and lentils, and she cooked for him. She didn't have a phone, and she was terrified to go out because she might get stopped by the police. Later, I tracked down the girl's parents in Sitwe. They were so happy that the girl had made it, that she hadn't been thrown off as a corpse from one of the Rohingya death boats on the Andaman Sea. Her husband had paid her passage, and a little extra too. It was enough to help the girl's brother to think about making the journey himself. I heard a couple years later that the girl had disappeared. She'd run away. I don't know where she went. I don't know how she could survive. I checked in with women's shelters, and no one had seen her. Her husband was furious. He paid good money for her. Mm -hmm. And not only had she run away, but she'd had the audacity to take some onions and lentils with her. I think of that often, how statelessness and hopelessness had left a man so angry that he complained in the same breath about the loss of his wife as the loss of someone else. At one point of the camps in Bangladesh, I met with some sex workers in Cox's Bazaar. They were all Rohingya. And because it was the daytime, when their kids were napping and the men weren't quite interested yet in what they offered, they had time to talk. I went there with a gentle Bangladeshi male colleague who was <coughs> translating for me. At first, the women were slightly embarrassed to talk through my colleague but they soon loosened up and were joking with me. At one point, one of the women's veil slipped back, and I saw an ugly scar by her eye. Mm -hmm. I asked her what had happened. Her husband, she said, had beat her. One day, he threw something at her and slashed her eye open. Regardless, she took her baby, and remarkably, she took her baby with her, and she left. But jobs are hard to find as a Rohingya single mother, which is how she ended up as a sex worker mostly catering to Bangladeshi men, but also to Rohingya as well. We got to talking about domestic violence, and one of the other women gathered in a circle around me, asked me whether I was married, and I said, yeah, I was. She said, well, how often does your husband beat you? And I said, well, never. <laughs> and she looked genuinely confused. And then, even though my male colleague was there, she pulled down her collar and showed me a scar on her shoulder. The next woman show me burns on her back. Another one welts on her arms. Every single woman sitting in that circle showed me something, some physical evidence of domestic violence, a scar or a bruise or a slash. My male colleague, who's married and lives in Dhaka, looked stricken. You have to report this, he said. Go to the police. But even as he said it, he realized the futility. If the Rohingya are powerless in Bangladesh, the women are most of all. Domestic violence, granted, is a huge problem among Myanmar's Buddhist communities as well. In the village, many men beat their wives. It's yeah. just what they do. 
But violence has so shaped the Rohingya experience that much of society's inner workings are designed to protect women from that kind of sexual violence that has been institutionalized by the Tatmadaw, as the Burmese army is known. Mind you, the Rohingya are not the only victims of this. The Tatmadaw uses <coughs> rape as a weapon of war in Myanmar's Kachin state, where most of the ethnic minority population is Christian. The army uses it in Karen and Shan states, where they are Buddhist too. In rural area, the Rohingya reaction has sometimes been to cloister women more than they might have even done by, by traditional social norms. Fathers told me they married their girls early and encouraged them to have more children because pregnancies might dissuade Burmese soldiers from rape. Sadly, that turned out not to be the case. Year by year, decade by decade, the Rohingya were stripped of their history. Their mosques were ordered closed. They could no longer go to university. The Rohingya Student Union at Rangoon University had no more Rohingya. Healthcare is almost non-existent. The fact that Rohingya were voted in to serve in parliament as recently as 1990, the fact that a Burmese cabinet member was an Arakan Muslim, that's erased from the history books. None of this excuses the kind of violence that pervades the camps, but it provides the context to understand it. The trauma of 2017, of 2016, of 2012, of 1992, of 1978, these successive waves of ethnic cleansing have led to a kind of hypersensitive fight or flight response among an entire population. In August 2017, in September of that year, as I mentioned, I watched from the Bangladesh border as hundreds of thousands of Rohingya fled rape and murder, whole villages burnt to the ground. They crossed over Myanmar any way they could, through jungle hills like these ones, with poisonous snakes, or in leaky boats across the sea. Remember again that it was the rainy season, and there was mud and water everywhere. People walked for days and days. There were landmines that claimed legs. I saw myself four or five people who had lost limbs as they were crossing the border. Every day, I would walk, wade with these people through the water, chest high, and it sucked off your shoes and your clothes, and I'd wash the Rohingya flood, flood in. The terrain was incredibly steep, and grandmothers and little kids would come skidding past on slick hills. Or they'd push their way through water, balancing a bag of rice on their heads as the currents pulled them. I know how to swim. Most of them did not. You'd find things cast off as the journey progressed things that they can no longer carry, sleeping mats, cooking pots, solar panels, mm -hmm. a newborn child who didn't make it. Mm -hmm. The rain just didn't stop, nor did the exodus. A month later, I went back to Rakhine State, just on the other border from Bangladesh. Government officials and Buddhists in general deny that anything was happening at all. They said that this whole ethnic cleansing genocide thing was a made-up conspiracy from oil-rich companies to create sympathy for Muslims. One official told me that it was fake news, showing how a uh, certain president's phrase has made it to <laughs> faraway Myanmar. <laughs> People I once admired, democracy activists, brave journalists, political prisoners who spent years in jail at the behest of the same generals who had persecuted the Rohingya refused to condemn the Tatmadaw. It was the national psychosis, and Dong Aung San Suu Kyi, she sanctified it. A Buddhist monk in Rakhine got so, got so angry that when I said that maybe the Rohingya hadn't burned down their own villages, which is what the common narrative in Myanmar was, he actually tried to slap me. A mob of Buddhists attacked foreign NGO workers who had dared to feed Rohingya in an internment camp. They shaved the head of an ethnic Rakhine woman who had sold food to Muslims. And I went to meet that woman. She was shaking the whole time we talked, and she was convinced that she was going to be assaulted again for daring to help the Rohingya. But she kept saying, they're human too. And it was a rare moment of humanity in a place where I saw too little of it. Over and over I heard that the reason I was making up stories about the Rohingya was because I was a secret Muslim, or my paper was being financed by Muslims, the Saudis apparently own the New York Times. 
now Rakhine state is controlled, is convulsed by conflict between the Tatmada and the Arakan army, the guerrilla fighting force of the Rakhine, who are themselves persecuted by the Burmese mm -hmm. military. For months, the internet has been basically switched off in the conflict zone. Last week, as someone mentioned earlier, the blackout was renewed. To interview people in central Rakhine camps without minders required sneaking around police barriers, wading through rice paddies, sometimes even using WhatsApp calls to call somebody who could speak Rohingya to translate, because I didn't want to get anybody on the ground in trouble and, and uh, under arrest. It's the same in the camps in Bangladesh, where internet access has been restricted on and off since September. And the Rohingya are even more isolated now that the Bangladeshi government has discouraged INGOs from, in some cases, paying Rohingya for, the, for some of their work, lest they use that money to build more permanent lives in Bangladesh. When the Burmese and the Bangladeshis hammered out details for repatriation, a program anyway that, that really failed to, to, to take off, no Rohingya were consulted in their fate. It's a lack of agency that is dehumanizing. The adrenaline of that flight from Myanmar in 2017 has worn off. People aren't going back. Kids aren't getting educated. Recently, a gang destroyed the church of a Christian Rohingya minority in the Bangladeshi camps. It spurred angry debates in the camps, much of it not sympathetic to the Christian minority. Were Christian Rohingya trying to steal Muslim souls? How could they be Christian if they were Rohingya? Do they even deserve to be called Rohingya? I want to go back to this issue of identity because it's central to the issue of statelessness. The Burmese state, starting with the nationalist demagoguery of General May Win, who, among his uh, many crippling uh, legacies for Burma, decided that it would be a good idea to denominate the currency in the number nine, which was his favorite number, and it, it he denationalized the rest of the currency, and then suddenly you had to be good at your nines times tables. <laughs> this Burmese state has succeeded in doing something which is very dangerous. It has made the Rohingya feel like they have to prove how long they have lived in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. Is it for generations? Is it forever? Is it since the British came and mucked everything up? The answer is all of the above. Mm -hmm. Myanmar is a country composed of dozens of ethnic groups who make up at least one third of the national population. Officially, there are 135 ethnicities that merit set citizenship but that's an incomplete and contradictory list. Mm -hmm. There are several Shan groups, subgroups that are listed, but not Chin ones. Some groups, like the Kokang, didn't exist at independence. The Kokang are ethnic Han Chinese, they speak Mandarin, they live in an enclave on the Chinese border, and yet they merit an official ethnic group, while other Han Chinese, some of whom were in Myanmar long before independence in 1948, they don't pass the citizenship test. The Kitchen, who live in northern, northern Myanmar, have many subgroups that should probably have their own categories. The Kitchen themselves don't even call themselves Kitchen. <laughs> I don't want to go on too long about this, but the point is, is why do the Rohingya, nearly uniquely among the ethnic minorities in Myanmar, why do they have to prove themselves while others get by with newer, fuzzier designations? I, I, want to, I want to end with an experience that I had in Sitwe 11 years ago, before the 2012 violence. Mm -hmm. I was there actually to do a story on the persecution of the ethnic Rakhine in Myanmar, and people were terribly scared. A tour guide who'd been in the democracy movement underground had just been arrested and thrown into a labor camp along with several of his colleagues. I was there under my antique collecting guise, and I went around and I inspected Rakhine lacquerware and other pretty things. One day, my guide said, he'd take me to his mother's tea house. I want to warn you, there's some bad people along the way, so I'm going to come pick you up. And I said, it's two blocks from my guest house. I think I can walk. A couple blocks later, I entered what was Nazir quarter in Sitwe. There were, there were mosques and women in loose veils. There was an elderly man with a cane and a beard dyed a brilliant orange. He spoke the kind of courtly English that you used to hear in Burma. Madam, he said, I believe you are not a native of this soil. <laughs> I said, I was not. I asked him if he was Rohingya. 
he looked confused and said he was an Arakan Muslim. He didn't even say Arakan Muslim, which was the term used often after independence. But what he wanted to make clear was that he really was from Rakhine, as Arakan is now known. He wanted to say that he was a native of the soil, even if he didn't have the paperwork to prove it. Because who does when the government wants to disenfranchise you? Mm -hmm. He told me proudly of his family history, the long line of imams, the bright students who had studied at Sitwa University, all Arakan Muslims, he said. By today's standards, the man was Rohingya. If he's alive today, I'm pretty sure he would use the word. The point is that identities shift, even if people don't. There are Muslims in northern Rakhine and in Bangladesh, too. There are also Buddhists in northern Rakhine and in Bangladesh. These are borderlands. Myanmar itself is like a giant borderland squashed between India and China, made into a country with a few swift lines on the map by British administrators. That's something that Bangladesh should understand, how colonial drafters fail to reflect the messy sprawl of people in hills and valleys and forests, how it's awfully hard to make a nation state adhere to ethnic boundaries. I've thought a lot about this man with his orange beard telling me earnestly that he was an Arakanese Muslim. A few years later, I went back to the Nazir quarter and it was all gone. I went to the IDB camps in both Myanmar and later in the refugee camps in Bangladesh looking for him, and I never found him. Maybe it's possible that he ran out of henna and I wouldn't recognize him with the orange beard. Maybe he's died. Last year, when I was on yet another government tour of northern Rakhine in Mongdaw district, our car was driving with this convoy, and we weren't stopped from, from stopping because they didn't want us to just go off and report and do things that we weren't supposed to do. But our car had a flat tire, and so we were kind of separated from the rest of the convoy. And we were driving through this devastated landscape, this green cemetery of Rohingya villages. For once, the Burmese government was right. There really were no Rohingya there, because it had all been erased from the landscape. And then suddenly, like an apparition, a complete Rohingya village appeared around a bumpy road. There was a mosque at sunset, and men in prayer caps on the veranda, taking off their shoes to wash before prayer. There were children slapping hoops and laughing. The scene was like a phantom from a parallel world, a glimpse into a Rohingya existence that mostly has been obliterated in Rakhine State. I won't go into here how that village survived, how the administrator somehow saved his people, but is now desperately trapped. That's not why I bring this up. It's because sitting on the mosque verano, veranda was an elderly man with a burnt umber beard who looked just like the man I'd met years before, the photographer with whom I was working. And he and I threw open the doors. And the driver looked nervous and said, no, 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 don't go. But we ran in anyway. And the photographer dashed into the mosque to take pictures before a minder showed up. And I walked up to the man and I said, "Salam alaikum, hello. Hello, he responded. And I waited for him to speak in English, to ask me whether I was a native of the soil. But he smiled and said nothing more. There was, I think, nothing left to say. <laughs> so we'll open it up to questions from the audience. This is a great position as a journalist to be the one <laughs> receiving the <laughs> questions. <laughs> yes, please, in the back. Um, you gave us a caveat at the beginning that you are not an academic. Uh, yes. You said, I think you described yourself as a glorious, uh, over, or glorified uh, note taker, something like that. But I'd still like to rely on your uh, um, expertise if I could. Uh, after Aung San Suu Kyi had her electoral success and people were asked the question, what was going to be the balance of power between Aung San Suu Kyi's party and the military, I thought I remembered them saying that there was a either a new constitution in 1980-81 or an amendment to the constitution in 80-81. I was wondering if you could tell me if you know anything about this constitution and whether that constitution made any provision for geographical autonomy, like the Shan state, for example, in um, Arakan or Rohingya state, and whether it was like linguistic pluralism or religious pluralism or anything like that. 
which was guaranteed by that constitution, and whether that constitution is still in force, yeah. and whether it's respected, even if it's, you know, whether the letter of the law is respected. I mean, w one of the ironies of Don San Suu Kyi is that her father was the founder of the yeah. modern Burmese army, Aung San, um, and before he was assassinated, actually before independence in 1948, he organized, because he was trying to create this nation state, he organized a, a conference called the Panlong Conference, in which he brought certain ethnic minorities, not the Rohingya, not a couple other big groups, together and said, look, if you join my Burma, um, and within five years, if you're not happy with, with what happens, um, then there is potentially a procedure to secede from the Union of Burma. Um, he died. Soon after that, there was a in relatively ineffectual civilian government. Uh, sorry, this is a long preamble. And, and then, <laughs> And then um, there was a military coup, and then it was you know, 50 odd, around 50 years of, of military rule. In uh, b shortly before the first quasi-free elections, um, there was a new constitution. There was a referendum for a new constitution, which the military drafted, and they put in several rules. There was some lip service paid to the idea not of autonomy and not even really of federalism, but this idea that the ethnic minorities should be respected. This was, of course, going on at the same time that Tamadal was engaged in bloody conflict with the ethnic armed groups. So it, there was clearly a, a division between what the paper said and what, um, what, the, uh, what was happening on the ground. And this constitution also had an infamous clause that prevented anybody who had been married to a foreigner or who had a foreign family mm -hmm. member uh, from becoming president, which yeah. precluded Dong San Suu Kyi from, uh, from uh, taking that position, which is why she's now this kind of special counselor. Um, so the constitution is rigged. It, the referendum itself was held shortly after Cyclone Nargis, which killed anywhere between 110 and 130,000 people, and mostly in the Irrawaddy Delta. The country was devastated. Um, the, the, the members of the top Madal, you know, around 400,000 people, uh, were ordered to vote a certain way. Um, there was a lot of political pressure to get this, th this constitution passed. Um, so the constitution that? to which you were referring is a previous one. There is now a new constitution that was designed by the military specifically to limit the powers of ethnic minorities and also to, to uh, limit Donald Trump's power. So the other constitution is erased, mm -hmm. the one from the Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, I was in Myanmar in February 2017, yes. and I met, um, actually the, the driver of the car that was taking me around um, told me on, on Friday that, uh, Madam, are you going to take a break uh, after lunch? Yeah. So I asked him why, he said, because he would like to go for his gym up there. Yeah. So I said, oh, are you Muslim then? Yeah. He said, yes. I said, are you Rohingya? And he actually literally, physically jumped. <laughs> <in my laughs> <head>. I <laughs> said, never. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are non-Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar who are under tremendous pressure mm -hmm. to yes. prove that you know, they have nothing to do with Rohingya. Mm -hmm. and that I think, I think you're right in that there is a significant amount of pressure. Um, I would also say, and I think I was talking to somebody about this last night, that Rangoon, as it was then known, um, was more than, Bamar Burmese were a minority in Rangoon in the 1930s and 40s, and then there were race riots and, and a lot of people left. Um, but it still has a thriving Muslim part, which is, which is in the kind of business, downtown business district. Uh, and there are very successful Muslim entrepreneurs. But I would say in the way that somebody in Washington um, who is you know, a millionaire, how much sympathy would they naturally have for a far off um, rural population of, in some cases, uneducated fishers and farmers? There is, there is I think, there's not an automatic um, camaraderie that comes from a shared religion. Add to that the fact that you that you pointed out, which is that, that you know, people do not want to be seen as being on the side of the Rohingya. But I think even even before that that sentiment was was prevalent, there's just not much tying these two communities together. 
and it's it's a discipline. I think it's you know it's it's a disappointment. Um, <coughs> Professor Cohen asked me this question, and I thought I would ask you. I'm <laughs> curious about your answer. Yeah. Um, but I am uh, in February of 2018. You wrote an article about um, your experience in the camps with. Ex like interviewing people who were mm -hmm. slaughtered and massacred, but the challenges of reporting truthfully, mm -hmm. and um, and in many, you know, it was quite controversial yeah. among academics that you know you a bit undermined the mm -hmm. Rohingya cause. And I'm wondering, three years down the line, how you feel about that article and what your thoughts are. I mean, again, I would say I'm not an activist. Um, my job is to observe as best as I can, and there's no such thing as pure objectivity, but there are slices of stories that I hope that I can tell that create a larger picture. Um, so whether that undermines a cause or not is not is not my role. What I wanted to do was to report something that I think was a big issue in the camps at the time. And, and I was uh, for about a year and a half, I was I was banned from from Myanmar um, because of reporting that I had done on Ashinura to the nationalist Buddhist monk, um, one of the uh, one of the largest post transition um, protests in Yangon um, was of hundreds of monks who were um, who were marching against me. Um, and Time Magazine, for, for which I worked. Mm -hmm. um, and so for a year and a half, I couldn't go back. You know, I felt, I, I felt devastated because I'd spent so much time connected to this country and trying to report about it. When the article came out, it was, as you say, extraordinarily controversial. Um, and I was then, uh, I, I was then uh, accused of being a secret Buddhist. Um, and that you know, maybe somebody was paying me on the Buddhist side and I was part of the Buddhist lobby. And it was compounded by the fact that the uh, Burmese state press, which had spent a lot of ink vilifying specifically what I had done in terms of my articles about the Burmese Buddhist nationalist movement, suddenly said, hey, you know, this person has changed her story. And I hadn't changed my story. These are all elements of, of a story that makes a greater whole. I, I will, say, and there was you know, a lot of anger within the Rohingya community, as, as you said, saying that this, that I had undermined the, the movement. I will say that I did get, um, and this is a minority compared to a lot of them. I got hundreds of, of hate mail um, from from people. I did get a fair number of messages from people who had worked in the camps, either in the Rohingya camps or in other refugee camps who said that this is something that they have faced. And if you ignore it, then you undermine the importance and the truth of so many other horrific stories. But not ignore it, but contextualize yeah. why there's inaccuracies in people's sure. stories. Sure. I, I think part of it was th there were a rash of stories and, and this was a critique of some journalism as well. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I work for a publication that allows me to spend a week um, talking to somebody. And if the story doesn't pan out, you know, I feel bad, but I'm not going to get fired from my job. I spent three weeks working with and, and profiling, getting to know three separate mm -hmm. families. And none of the stories panned out. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, there were other articles about those three families. Um, that presented information that I knew was not correct. Now, I'm not saying that the journalists made it up. I think that they just didn't ask. They didn't have the time. You know, if you're, if you're on a quick deadline and you don't have the luxury of time that I do, then you, you just, you know, you accept what the person says and you write it and it's a hell of a story. But that's not, it's incumbent on me to keep on searching and looking and, and figuring it out because Again, it delegitimizes the stories of people who really want the terrible things. And I think in the article, and I, tr I tried, maybe I failed, but I, tr I tried to say, look, that's the reason that we have, to, we have to look at this properly and carefully. Because if we don't, it gives ammunition to the side that says, oh, this is all made up. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, Samira had a question. Thank you so much for your talk and for traveling all this way to give it. Um, I have a, I guess, newspaper-oriented question, um, kind of to follow up on Rohini's question. How does the New York Times and in your experience as a journalist, um, how do these publications actually prioritize uh, publishing on these stories, especially when they're around these refugee crises that often have these um, limited time spans and there's as fatigue on the part of like the audience of these newspapers to keep reading about these types of stories. How do you balance what you think people might be interested in reading versus you as a Southeast Asia Bureau Chief um, commenting on these things that are obviously ongoing um, from the publication um, standpoint? Questions or you um, I, I can just answer you, yeah, okay. otherwise I might forget. <laughs> so, um, so Southeast Asia is a dozen countries. Um, and each country has its own complicated history. Um, there is certainly a narrative toward more authoritarian leadership, um, towards populism, towards ethno-nationalism across the region. So there is there is kind of an overall theme into which the, the Myanmar and the Rohingya issue fit in. Um, I, uh, it's a story that I, about and I have been covering for 15 years, um, which is not to say that I have covered everything in incrementally because I don't live, you know, I don't live in Cox's, I don't live in Dhaka, I don't live in, in Yangon, um, but we have a good good core of, um, of reporters, um, both in Bangladesh and, and, and in Myanmar. Um, so I have never had a situation where I have said to my editors, you know, I want to write a story about whatever, and they said, mm, no, there's, there's donor fatigue or there's reader fatigue. Um, it is more a question of suddenly there's a coronavirus or mm -hmm. suddenly there's you know, a, a, uh, an earthquake in Indonesia, and, and there's only so much in an area where we have fewer foreign correspondents. I mean, we have a foreign correspondent in Southeast Asia, which is great, but um, they, uh, it's, it's hard to just physically find the time uh, to cover everything, and then I end up covering everything badly, which is depressing. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, it, it's, I don't feel like the Times, and this is different from when I worked at Time Magazine, um, mm -hmm. I don't, I've never felt that the New York Times, that they have said, no, we're not interested, because I think that they feel that it's incumbent upon them to cover what is an extraordinarily important story. Um, you know, not, and we can try to imbue it with geopolitical import, and I think that's important. And I spent 15 years living in China, and I'm always looking for sort of how does China affect affect things, you know, in Myanmar and in other parts of Southeast Asia. But it's important because it's it's a question about a people whose identity is being erased by a group of people who have who have not changed their story a bit. And psychologically, I, want, I really want to understand that. I want to understand why my friends don't see my side. You know, I, I've known Aung San Suu Kyi for a long time, and I've spoken with her many times. Mm -hmm. And with her, I'm a little bit less surprised, because I think there has been, even from, from the earliest times when I interviewed her, there was something about her that does not surprise me as to what as to who she became. Um, mm -hmm. But there are other democracy activists who genuinely surprised me, and I'm still kind of struggling with this issue. Um, how does this you know, how does this happen? And and you can say maybe it's an education system that was broken for 50 years, and because of that, the, the Burmese monasteries became de facto schools, right? And within that. Um, they provided not only schools but healthcare. I mean, they were the social structure when the when the Burmese government just kind of broke down, and so they have a level of respect um, from the Burmese people that is extraordinarily high. Um, and so, you know, particularly for women to 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 contravene or to con to to speak up against the, the Sangaj, uh, to speak up against the Burmese. Um, monastery is very, very difficult. So all of these issues are things that I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by. Um, not just, I mean, when somebody is asking why, wh what is it about the, 
what caused the Top Magal soldiers um, to unleash this kind of using rape as a weapon of war and, and, and using it in different ways. Um, that is, those kinds of questions are something that personally I, I really I want to understand. Um, I know maybe it's because I have to say a name is Hannah Arendt, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Professor Rian, and the one back there, and the, um, for, oh, yes, me. So, very quick, if you can have a quick question, we'll have time for these last. Three so, I have long answers. No, no, that's <laughs> okay. Please make your questions quick. Very briefly, Arsa, yes. you mentioned about it. When it came out, everyone tried to point that it is a part of ISIS and all sorts of things. I don't think necessarily the truth. Because we'll be on here and back here. Oh. No, I mean, there were the campaigns saying that it has been uh, connected to the Saudis and, and uh, ISIS and all sorts of things, which I, I, I was never convinced. You know, I opposed yeah. it altogether. And yet, you are mentioning now that the, the presence of Arsa in the camp, I understand yeah. that. How do you see, the, you know, has there been any change in Arsa that you have noticed, or is it the same organization that was there uh, when it suddenly, you know, became the headline of everything, and now what we are seeing? I, I mean, I, I would say that any speculation that Arsa had a connection to ISIS, there's nothing that is proven, and I, I, I have never nor has the New York Times ever propagated that. No, I'm not that suggesting that, that, and that, that, that idea. They're, they're big. Sure, sure. they're sure, yeah. Um, I mean, any time you know, a radical Islam group comes out, they say, oh, it must be connected to ISIS. I mean, that's, I, I think Arsa was a very local expression of anger from young men who couldn't get jobs, um, who couldn't travel, um, who had the religious system kind of ripped out of villages. Um, and a lot of people who are uneducated because the school system has been closed down. And so it's, <coughs> it's natural why people will become disenfranchised. Um, I, I do think the kind of role of Hafazat, um, you know, from Chittagong, uh, within the camps was something that is, is complicated. And I don't, I don't know enough about it, um, except to say that, um, if I wanted to go and meet with people who, at the time, this is only the first two months after after the August 2017, if I wanted to meet with people who had who said that they had been in Arsa and some of them had gunshot wounds to, to prove at least that they were in some sort of conflict situation, and they had, I mean, talking about you know, physical evidence, the, 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 the gunshot wounds were this way and not that way. <coughs> so it seemed like there were people who were shooting toward the police bases as opposed to running away. Um, they, they, it was easy to meet them in, in some of the mosques um, that had been built and funded by Hifatha. Um So you know, what, what, what that means long term, I don't know. Um, but I think there is, in any society of well, 700,000 people, 745,000 people since August 2007, around a million from, you know, total before, um, you, as you said, you're going to have elements of criminality. Um, and, and ARSA is a, is a representation of that. Um, yes, crime rates are probably low compared to maybe other places, um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I think that that seed of discontent in an area where there are not obvious paths towards education where, where young, able-bodied men cannot go easily and work out outside. Um, it leads to a very volatile situation. And it's something that I think that we all, it's incumbent upon us to, to watch it, if nothing else. You were mentioning Arsa and Hefaz at the same breath. Do you see any connection? To use? I saw in the first two months that Arsa meetings were taking place in mosques that were funded by Hefaz. But not there I was gone for a month and then I came back and by that point the the Bangladeshi government and the Majis were saying that there is no Arsa here. Mm -hmm. So it was harder to find people in open air mosques speaking frankly about this. So very quick. Yeah. Um, 
Do you have any intention of writing a New York Times hardcover nonfiction bestseller <laughs> <laughs> about your, all of your experience, all these stories, and the, the, the overall narrative to basically um, educate a reading public that may not be that well educated, and maybe read some of your stories but has never read a whole book about it? Yeah, I, I, th that would require um, time that perhaps I do not have. Um, There are many books out there, um, and maybe at some point I will write one. But uh, I'm not. I'm not in a great hurry to do it at the moment. I've got a. I've got. I've got uh, a multitude of deadlines that are going to keep me busy before that. <laughs> and then yes, in the back. Um, sorry to say this, but because earlier I wasn't able to include this um, in the discussion that we have earlier, but I yeah. do have a question for you. Yeah. Um, with your question, Steve, it was about you know how do we engage. How do we actually include the voices of Bohemia? Yeah. This kind of place would be a very good place to start. I know that I'm the only one yeah. Rohingya here, yeah. and it's it's. I, I feel the burden of, of sharing, and, and I feel the burden of trying to to include everything that I know possible. But again, you know, it it would be really really wonderful to have other perspectives because I'm only limited to a few kind of perspectives that I could offer because my lived experience is completely different from, from others. So that said, um, you talked about you know, uh, um, interviewing uh, you know, genocide survivors and whatnot. I have heard of you know, many accounts of people being over-interviewed. And mm -hmm. one woman was interviewed 69 times mm -hmm. over the past two years. Yep. It is incredibly, yeah. incredibly um, destructive one psyche. Sure. And I just wonder, you know, at least in research we have guidelines yeah. on, you know, not over interviewing subjects and making sure that there are a certain set of rules that you go over <coughs> before you actually interviewing them and, and making if it's if it's involved, you know, something that is completely uh, draining <laughs> or exhausting yeah. towards some you know, towards someone's psychological capacity, then you actually yeah make sure that you have resources available for them afterwards, sure. at least, you know, some sort of support. Yeah. So I don't see that in the camps, and as a journalist yourself, yeah. I'm sure that you've seen a lot of those happening. Yeah. What do you normally do in order to ensure that that does not happen to people that you interview? I mean, I'm a bad journalist in that I don't like packs of people, and so if there are a bunch of people over there, I want to go that way. Um, I, I happened to get to Bangladesh very quickly, so I was there by August 27th, um, and there were not that many, at the time, there were not that many foreign journalists there. So in some ways, because of the timing, I was able to sort of get there first and talk to and you know, talk to people. Um, because the New York Times has a readership that is pretty broad, um, I then kind of watched as some of the people that we spoke to um, were, there, were, were then interviewed and re-interviewed and re-interviewed. Um, there were cases in which I spoke to, uh, to minors, um, some of whom were pregnant, um, some of whom were pregnant from rape. Um, and I think in some journalistic circumstances, there's this idea that you, you just, it's, you, know, you, you, don't, you don't go to the other side, and I think that's ridiculous. I mean, I, everybody that I spoke to who I thought was in a vulnerable situation, you know, in fact, I had a pretty good relationship with people with BRAC on, on, on the ground, um, and made sure that they would be getting prenatal care, saying, look, I, I met this woman um, in, in a critical long extension here or here or there, um, and I was in daily contact with BRAC to try to figure out, and I, and I tracked their stories. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, different journalists have different ways of doing things, but again, because I have the luxury of time at the times, because they allow us to sort of get to know people, um, it's not like I was going in for like a 15 minute, so, so how do you feel about being raped? I mean, it was, you, know, you, you sit and you have cups of tea and you talk and you talk to the parents and you talk to the, 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 the brothers and you, you develop a rapport. Um, and I have, you know, my, my WhatsApp until, well, until things became trickier with the internet stuff. Um, I probably have 10 or 15 messages a day um, from people in the camps, and we keep in touch. Um, and that is, 
it's it's not it's not a substitute from being there, um, but I I feel like it's important as journalists, even though I said I'm not an activist, um, to to maintain the humanity of people, and and you know and that's why even I mean even in my kind of rambling talk I wanted to say like these are you know, understand the histories of these people because. It's it's so easy to talk about this like faceless number that you can't you know it's just impossible to comprehend, um, and it is by knowing these specific people, um, but that puts a burden on them because like they're the person who is is you know in the way that you are the only Rohingya here and there's there's weight on your shoulders there's a weight on their shoulders too, um, but my feeling is. In some ways, it's better to go and talk to somebody who hasn't been interviewed 69 times. Like that's the last thing I would want to do. I would rather find somebody whose story may seem a little bit less dramatic, but is is <coughs> giving me a fresh perspective, um, who isn't going to be kind of weighed down by yet another foreigner coming in and getting that money quote. I mean, that's that's not the kind of journalism that I wish to do. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you so much.